Recently, I cycled across the USA with my friend Justin. Here's a list of 10 things that I learned along the way. And a lot of these won't just apply to our bike trip, but any bike tour. Number one, less is more. We rode this trip mainly unsupported, so strapping all of the stuff that we needed to our bikes or in a trailer towed behind mine. I've done three or four week long bike trips before, but never one this long. We were away for two and a half months in total. Funnily enough, you need exactly the same amount of stuff. I took two sets of kit, which was plenty, one set of normal clothes, tools, spare parts for the bikes, and then camera gear. M most people probably wouldn't need as much camera gear as I take with me. Even though we packed conservatively, we were throwing away stuff all the time. You just don't need that extra t-shirt, you don't need four jerseys. And if you take less stuff, then it's easier to find things. So it reduces the amount of time you're spent looking for stuff, trying to find tools, trying to find bits of kit, and then the repack again in the morning when you've unpacked all your stuff in whatever accommodation you're staying in. Overpacking becomes surprisingly annoying to deal with. I wish we'd arrived with less. You can always buy more stuff on the road. We cycled on a variety of roads during the trip, from farm gravelly track roads all the way to the Interstate 10, one of the biggest roads that runs the whole length of the USA. And on the whole, the big roads felt pretty safe. Firstly, everything in America is huge, and the roads are built to accommodate massive trucks. Nearly all of them have a massive hard shoulder as well. Granted, our ride was more of a challenge than a holiday, so we weren't looking for nice roads per se. We wanted a fairly direct route across. We were also limited on which roads we could choose based on the weather. If we went too far north, then it got really cold. So we had limited choices. After the first two weeks, we realized that small roads meant being chased by dogs. We called this Dogland. And they tended to have a bumpy surface, which wreaked havoc on Justin because of his bike setup and how low down it was on the ground. Whereas the bigger roads like Highway 90, we spent a lot of time on that, and the Interstate 10 was super smooth, five mile an hour faster because the trucks were pushing the wind forwards and gave us a little bit of a boost. And they all seemed to have a wide and clean hard shoulder much cleaner than the hard shoulder on the smaller roads, which cause problems. Now, I wouldn't recommend planning a whole route across the USA just on these big roads because you're gonna miss a lot of fantastic riding, but if you have to end up on them, it's not a disaster. Don't try to avoid them and make your route 100 miles longer just for the sake of it. A lot of them were really good and totally rideable. Quick disclaimer, if you're gonna ride on the interstates, do check that it's legal. If there's no other route options available, then usually it is, but some of the time, if there's another alternate route that's close by, you're not allowed to ride on them. There's usually a sign. Food affects your mood. More than ever, this trip showed me how important it is eating good food. There were some days where we were riding and we felt fantastic, and then we realized it was because we ate some fruit the day before. Not always an easy thing to achieve when you're cycling through the middle of the desert. We found most of the gas station food didn't have much nutritional value at all. There's not much you can do about that, but if you see fruit, buy it, keep it in your pack, and hope it lasts long enough because it really does make a difference to how well you go on the bike and off the bike too. On top of that, on the days where we didn't eat enough volume of food, of calories for dinner, because we just didn't want to, it reaches the point where you don't want to eat because it's just horrible, we really suffered the next day. You can't get on top of fueling properly and no matter how much you eat on the bike, if you haven't eaten enough the night before, it really messes you up. So just force yourself to eat more than you ever would if you're riding day after day after day. That was my experience anyway. Some of you might be able to get away with eating less, but on the whole, I've done a lot of these rides and more is more. White bar tape was a bad idea. We were gonna get punches despite which tires we used. We punctured my Hutchinson Fusion 5s, we punctured Justin's Gator skins more than anything, we punctured the Pirelli punch and protective tires that we picked up at a bike shop halfway through the trip, and we even punctured Justin's wheelchair tires, which are Schwalbe Marathon Pluses, highly regarded as one of the most punch and protective tires you can buy. Those are the tires that you get on Boris bikes and city bikes. The likelihood of you getting punctures is definitely more down to what you ride over rather than the tire choice. Sure, it will reduce your chances having some puncture protection, like these are race tires. They're super supple and super thin and feel nice to ride. Whereas Justin was riding gator skins, which have a layer of puncture protection underneath. But most of the punches that we ended up getting were gonna puncture anyway. So it was really long thorns, pieces of glass, or bits of metal that like have flown off trucks and they were all just sitting in the hard shoulder. One last note here, and this is personal opinion, personal preference. I would rather fix three punches a day on an easy to remove tire like this than one a day on a Schwab Marathon Plus. Thankfully, we managed to get back to the hotel room before wrestling with that. Doing that by the side of the road, 
I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Single wheel bicycle trailers are not for going fast. About two weeks into the trip, we started using a trailer to carry Justin's wheelchair instead of strapping it to the back of his bike, which led to it breaking. So, we didn't know anything about trailers. We bought a one wheel one. A one wheel one. There's a 15 mile an hour speed limit on it for a reason. When it was loaded with weight and behind my bike, it attached to the through axle. So the bike lent with the trailer. We had the wheelchair and all of my bags stuffed in it and over 50 mile an hour, it was very unstable. I found it was pushing me around, my handlebars wobbling everywhere. If there was any bits of wind or direction changes, not rideable over 15 mile an hour safely. That was a really miserable ride, but a few weeks later we did solve the problem by switching to a two-wheeled trailer with one arm which fixes to your through axle, which fixes to your back wheel, and when we had that the bike could articulate on its own and the trailer just felt like you were pulling something heavy, but the handling of the bike wasn't affected. So if you're going to do a ride similar to this where you've got to carry a lot of stuff and you're going to use a trailer, two-wheel would be my recommendation. That's what we will continue to use next time if we do another one. Unless we can figure out an even better way to carry a wheelchair on a handbike. Which brings us on nicely to my next point. If you care about speed, weight doesn't matter that much, but aero does. Okay, we weren't riding through the mountains. The hilliest part of our trip was around Phoenix through Arizona and Joshua Tree National Park towards the end. But weight wasn't really a killer and my bike plus loaded trailer was over 50 kilograms. We were riding close to sunset most days because it was winter and there was limited daylight, so speed did matter. This is where we noticed the slightest bit of wind, be it a crosswind or a headwind, really affected me when I had the trailer on the back of my bike. It was pretty loaded up and it was like dragging a second person through the wind and it was a big difference in power to maintain the same speed. We're talking 50, 60 watts on some days. If we did this again, I'm really gonna rack my brain and try and figure out a different, faster solution because the trailer was slower and it did take away a bit of the enjoyment, particularly on the descents. As soon as you're hitting 50, 60K an hour, then you're creating even more drag and you just sort of top out and can't go any faster. Not that fun. People are generous and willing to help. From daily cash donations to people buying our lunch, some people didn't even know we were doing it for charity. Sean Barnes driving up and down the same stretch of road to find us when Justin's wheelchair broke and taking us to a top secret location where his friend Larry welded Justin's wheelchair back together. Raul intercepting our route and driving us around a bridge which was closed and then taking delivery of a trailer for us. Ryan joining us for multiple rides and then letting us draft his car for half a day and then riding with us again and breaking all of his bike stuff and himself. Fabian finding us on the side of the road and giving us fruit and then joining us for the route through El Paso and showing us the best way through. Trevor and Grace escorting us through Phoenix and then supplying us with a home cooked meal, which we really needed. Jason showing up in Joshua Tree with essentially the Batmobile of support cars with a taser stick and a flamethrower just in case of bear <laughs> attacks. And of course, LAPD for closing down the whole of LA and giving us a rolling road closure through the city on our last day. Pretty overwhelming. All of that. Top tube bag is the one. This is a full length bag that runs along your top tube with a zip in it. And I've never used one of these on a bike packing trip before and it was fantastic. What a brilliant location to have your food, stuff that you want to access quickly, like bars, cycling cap for when you stop at the uh, cafe. I also had a Ugh. Insta360 camera on a selfie stick. Not everyone's gonna have that. There aren't that many places on a bicycle where you can put bags and access them while you're riding. I had food pouches on the front, which were really useful. Bar bag, you can just about get stuff out of, but there's a risk of it falling out. Whereas this is just right in front of you. You need one zip to access it. You can do it with one hand. And uh, yeah, definitely gonna keep using this going forwards. One note here, I know people do struggle sometimes with full length top tube bags touching their knees when they're cycling. I didn't notice a problem. This is a prototype one from Tailfin, which is not available for purchase yet. I believe they're gonna be releasing these in the future, but they also do a shorter. So it will just be at the front here and uh, less chance of your knees actually hitting it. So test one out if you can, uh, before you commit to buying one because your knees might touch it and that gets really annoying and then it'll like chafe and ruin the bag and probably ruin your skin. Top tube bag. Justin's hand bike was terrible. It was badly made and fell apart on multiple occasions in different locations. The front of it fell apart. There was a massive hole in the bottom. It was too low down to the ground. 
it was a bit of a nightmare. Thankfully, a guy called Rob from Carbon Bike Repair flew in from the UK just to repair it by the side of the road with sheets of carbon fibre. We were very lucky that happened. Justin's bike also cost £16,000, which goes to show you how much accessible equipment, sports equipment, can cost. That's why we did this trip, to raise money for Get Kids Going, which is a charity that supplies equipment like the handbike and wheelchairs, racing wheelchairs, basketball wheelchairs, that kind of stuff to kids with disabilities. I'm gonna leave the link in the description down below to our fundraiser, which is now about $200,000, £165,000. It's exceeded all expectations, but if you're watching this and you haven't seen the previous series, haven't donated, please consider having a look at that link and uh, spreading the message about Get Kids Going. Maybe. It will mean some people can get hold of bikes that are better than Justin's. Those are my 10 tips. I wanted to end this video with a quick reveal of the Tailfin competition. We gave away a bunch of Tailfin bags during the trip and they finally drawn the names out of the hat. If your name is on the screen now, Tailfin are gonna be in touch and you've won a bag. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. See you guys soon.